Welcome to Loco Gringo, Mexico, the place where we transform a tourist into a traveler because you deserve to see more of the world than just what's in a guidebook. Each week, we talk with amazing locals who know the Riviera Maya and Yucatan like only a local can and get them to share their tips and insights on the local scene, culture, and cuisine from a local's perspective. So pour yourself a margarita, grab a comfy chair, and let's get the show going. Hey, everybody, this is Kay from Loco Gringo. Thanks for joining us today. You know, I am going to introduce you to a great guy. He's originally from Minnesota, and he left um, his last place of residence was Kansas City, Missouri, when he moved to Ishkalak, Mexico. Now, for those of you who don't know where Ishkalak is, that is the southern part of Quintana Roo. It is um, part of the Costa Maya area. And my friend Dave has been... Um, in Ishkalak for 33 years. And he's an amazing guy with his wife, Ilana. We've been great friends over the years, so I'm really happy to introduce you to my friend Dave Randall of Costa de Cocos. Hey, Dave, how are you today? Good morning. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. I'm waiting for that coffee to kick in. <laughs> well, I had mine pretty early today. <laughs> so, Dave, I can't believe when you said that thir- it's been 33 years. And December, we will have been opened uh, at the hotel for 33 years. We uh, started with uh, five rooms, cabanas, all built out of uh, native hardwoods, rock, and a uh, thatch roof. Uh, and now we're up to uh, 17 rooms here with a full bar and restaurant. Now, I have to ask, how the hell did you pick Ishkalak out of all the places in <laughs> the Caribbean, you wind up in Ishkalak. It was uh, really weird. I got here at uh, 1130 one night, and I'm looking right now at the sea grape tree where I was camped uh, the first night I ever got here. Ended up buying the uh, piece of property I have my house on now by 830 the next morning. I had spent a couple of months going around the Gulf, all the small towns there, out to uh, Islam Harris, then um, down to uh, Tulum uh, and Playa area, but I, I couldn't aff- afford anything that I found. I found this big, beautiful white sand bay uh, that I had spent five days trying to find the owner, and it was selling for like $2 million. It was like crazy. So that went on to Belize. Didn't like Belize so much back then, and I ended up, uh, somebody told me about Escalac. It was just a sand, funky road getting down here, and got here at 11.30 at night. And then about a year after I got this place, I bought the land or uh, Coke Beach. So what I was doing was a... Um, catfish uh, operations, three months of the year that everything was dormant. And uh, so I decided to start this hotel project. I got to tell you, that was a a big statement. It's like buying a sailboat and saying you're going (laughs) to sail around the world because it is not an easy deal. No, and there wasn't there, and and I I think it goes without saying, but a lot of people who are listening don't realize is that there was no electricity down there back then. Because I forget, I remember for a while y'all didn't have electricity. There was no no regular. There's no pole power, is there? Uh, we just got electricity uh, about twelve years ago in the town. The man that put the cruise ship here in Mahawa, which is thirty five miles north of us, put. For him to get electricity there, they made him pay for electricity all the way down to Escalaf and then north almost 15 uh, miles. So that's how we got electricity. The Mexican government didn't do it. It was done privately. But I still don't have electricity at the hotel. I'm one kilometer north of the town, and we have uh, two wind generators and two uh, propane these uh, propane generators as backup. So for the last 33 years, we've been producing our own electricity out there, and uh, I don't see any electric coming anytime soon. Hey, that means that you guys are green friendly before green friendly was even cool. I got to tell you, we were green friendly. Uh, yeah, 
definitely. <laughs> uh, I think we started off with like a one kilowatt of solar panels and thought that was a big deal. Hey, it, you know, you take the victories where they come. I have to, uh, Dave, can you tell me, was your, you know, as you travel up and down the coast you, you, 33 years ago looking for some land, for, um, I mean, did you have it in your heart that you wanted to start a, 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 a hotel and a fly fishing business? I mean, did, was that concept there or was it, how did you start, how did you start with the hotel and fishing? Well, after I bought this uh, property, I hadn't even been into the town. I'm about uh, 200 miles north of the city limits right now at my house. So uh, when I arrived here, I hadn't gone into the town yet. So after about the middle of the day, I went into town and I met a guy from Michigan, a guy from South Africa, uh, and a guy from Tampa, Florida, all Americans, uh, excuse me, minus the South African, obviously, who was Cesar Sherrard from San Ignacio up in Belize. And he had a hotel and bed and breakfast restaurant operation there. So the guy, Jack, uh, he was filling tanks with what I know now is a tiny little compressor in a couple of 50-gallon uh, tanks. Scuba, uh, scuba tanks, right? Scuba tanks. But it was a little diesel compressor about the size of a suitcase, and he had the tank sitting in half a 50-gallon barrel trying so they wouldn't heat up while he was... Uh, Filling them. So that was the dive operation. <laughs> and uh, Barry, who just came here, he was a builder, home builder, but spent a couple of months, a year down here doing fishing charters, uh, spear fishing, diving, uh, offshore fishing, etc., just with local pongas. So we're drinking rum and talking story and uh, I said man the only thing we don't have to get tourism started down here is a hotel so uh, obviously uh, way in the bag I said oh well, well I could I can build some rooms uh, uh, down <laughs> if I could get some property <laughs> that wow, damn rum a, gets you every what time a, what a statement that was I gotta tell you so anyway, uh, about a year after that, I ended up buying the property where Costa Cocos is and starting. Well, needless to say, within um, probably that year, all three of those guys were gone. Uh, and uh, I was pretty much the only guy down here trying to do any business. And I didn't have any dive equipment. Uh, I, I didn't even have a dock. I had a lady that... Uh, and you know what the beach is like down here. Not yep. the greatest, but once you get out about 100 meters, it's beautiful. It's just incredible. That's gorgeous. So uh, I, that was my big thing. I first built the rooms, then I had to do the dock. And uh, I think California, the Cameron, started the first dive shop. No, he was from Texas, Wes uh, Boughton. I think you know him. Anyway, yeah, the name sounds familiar. Was, the first dive shop then he built a dive shop of his own in town and moved down there so after a series of two or three different dive shops we bought all of our own gear and boats and started doing the operation ourselves which we still do today we just have uh, maybe five or six divers at a time it's a real low-key one-on-one kind of uh, experience nothing big now that's that's on your diving end of things. Now, how did all the fish? Were you a fisherman when you came down there? I had a um, twenty-five foot dusky that I did some offshore fishing with, just personal. I never had guided. I I don't think I did. Uh, so I, as things got a little leaner and leaner down here, uh, you know the expense of trying to build something in Mexico. I started offshore fishing, um, and then I had a guy came through and started talking about fly fishing, Dial Duncan, who used to own Paradise Lodge. So Dial ended up owning, loaning me the money to get a couple of flats boats fixed up, motors, uh, fly rods, showed me how to do some tie, tie flies and stuff like that. Dial Duncan became my banker for the next 15 years. 
he uh, him being the only uh, person probably on the planet that would loan me money being uh, 70 miles in the jungle trying to start a business and groom of fly fishing uh, uh, charter business and stuff like that or the dive shop it uh, it's been uh, over 25 years ago that we started uh, fly fishing <clears throat> it's still growing uh, we developed a real nice um, group of guides uh, we've built up now to seven flats boats and we've got nine guides extra motors extra transmissions um, but it's it's uh, still evolving. Um, as you know, up by Playa del Carmen and uh, Tulum area, there are nearly 80 boats working in that bay up there. We have a total of 12 on a bay that's 65 miles east to west and 35 miles north to south. So we've got a lot of uh, unexplored territory even after all these years. But we really haven't had to press so much because we've got 40 flats right now that we can go to that produce fish year-round. It's not the prime time of the year like um, May and June and July are, but we produce fish daily for, for everybody that's out there. So it's, it's, it's really coming on good. So, Dave, I, you, you dropped just a little bit there. So you're saying, no, so your prime season is what? November or October, November, and December or December, November, December, and January? October, November, and December, we do a two-for-one special because it's not prime time. Our prime time oh, okay. is May, June, and July for bone fishing. But that kind of competes with Montana and Wyoming and Colorado where people are trout fishing. But doing the two-for-one special, we're getting people down, which, as you well know, is hurricane season um, in the Caribbean and not too much going on. But this has really helped us uh, develop some income at other times of the year. Is there a certain time of the year you always hear about the Grand Slam? And and, and, and for those of, for the people who are listening, Grand Slam, we're not talking about baseball here. In the land of fly fishing, a Grand Slam is what? Tarpon, schnook, bonefish, and isn't there another one in there? It's a permit, tarpon, and bonefish. And uh, I had a Grand Slam at our place two days ago. The man is leaving out today. Our groups run Saturday to Saturday. On his honeymoon with his new bride, gets a grand slam. Now, he had been a trout fisherman, but had never fished saltwater before. So he's got a smile ear to ear and going home with some really good stories. Oh, the, 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 you know, that's just an opening for some some jokes and some off-color comments. Honeymoon, grand slam, and a smile on his face. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll let that go right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Um, so... Now, do you go out and fish anymore, Dave? I got to ask because, you know, I know I moved down to dive and I don't dive anymore. Um, you, do you ever get out on the boat and, and cast out a line? I have probably haven't been on the water in a year. Um, my wife, uh, every time her brother comes for a week or two, they're out fishing quite a lot or other old friends that come through. But uh, no, Alana loves to fish, and uh, I'm more into doing the brewing and distilling now. I'm trying not to, uh, I've got a really good manager at the hotel, Chai, that's been with us seven years now. So I'm kind of between the hotel, the distillery, the brewery, and uh, don't have a lot of time for uh, fishing. So tell me a little bit about the brewery. I know the last time I was down at the hotel, I tried a tarp and pale ale. Now I haven't had any of your distilled spirits, but how did you, how did you wind up doing that? Was there a shortage of beer in Ishkalak and you decided to brew your own? How did all that start? You know, uh, 40 years ago, I was in, involved with the Hopland Brewery for about a year. And I just never forgot about that smell of that beer cooking off and fermenting. It's just, it's, it's really nice. And uh, so I got, uh, went through some uh, brewery tours in Portland, ended up buying a little uh, do-it-at-home uh, kit, uh, 
which I had flown in from Florida by uh, a guy that has it comes down here with a private plane. But Alana had bought me a little Sabco um, Brewer. It's about 15 gallons at a time. So I was working with that, working with that. And uh, so that finally, we developed this nice little uh, nano brewery. We do the Tarpon Tail Ale, uh, Red Ale, uh, Porter, and now I've got a um, uh, stout that's uh, oatmeal stout that's really good. So these are all six, seven percent uh, beers. You don't get anything like that in Mexico. So we're one of two breweries now in the state of Quintana Roo. Oh, excellent, excellent. And now, what what are you what are you distilling um, in terms of spirits? Is it are we making bathtub gin or what? What are you cooking up? Um, now I've uh, I've got a uh, two hundred gallon uh, cooker. It's like a double boiler, I guess, that I can uh, make up two hundred gallons of mash at a time. So I always have anywhere from eight hundred to twelve hundred gallons of mash working. I'm on my second still now. I bought a uh, 500 gallon still, and I started off with a 100 gallon still, and I just use that as my finished still. So I'm running everything twice, um, and then I make a vod. That's just a regular corn whiskey, like you read about the white lightning and stuff. I've got about a thousand gallons of that in. Uh, new oak barrels, which I had custom built in Guadalajara, and then I started making a vodka. It's a corn-based um, vodka. If they, if you've tried Tito's before, it's I think it's better than Tito's, probably because I uh, made it and I'm drinking it. But uh, <laughs> it came out really. I mean, I'm just amazed when these things work. It's just, you're sitting around uh, dreaming up these harebrained ideas, and then when they really work, it, it's really nice. Well, I'll have to come down there and, and sample that. I have had Tito's vodka, um, and actually I vodka's uh, one, of my fa- one of my favorite liquors. Um, so, yeah, I'll have to make a point of coming down and uh, having a cocktail with you. Please, anytime. So, you know, after 33 years... And I know numerous hurricanes, um, various challenges that, you know, probably, you know, raise the hair on the people of back of people's necks if they heard everything you've been through. What keeps you so excited to keep going and, you, you know, reinventing your the businesses and everything like that? What what drives you to keep it all going? Well, um, I've got now 28 employees that all have families and we, we need to produce a couple hundred meals a day here to keep all them uh, going and their families going. And um, in Escalac, there's not a lot to do but work and uh, daydream. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, just, things just keep uh, unfolding, I guess you'd say. You know, it's a lot of work to get the word out there get people to go that extra couple hours uh, south of Tulum down to Ishkalak. But it, it, once they get here, I usually get them to, they're coming back every year or two for, I've got clients that have been coming here for over 25 years. So long, long-term friendships uh, evolve out of these little remote places. Um, yeah, no, I have to say, I mean, we've all been friends now for, oh, a long time. And I think all we do is pop in one day and been fast friends ever since. Yes, definitely. No, um, we go away. I don't even, I'm not even going to say I'll probably go back, but a long way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know we were all, we were all a little younger when we started exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, uh, you know, tourism in uh, the state of Quintana Roo is, well, the state of Quintana Roo probably raises more money through tourism than they do even uh, through agriculture or anything else that's going on down here. So we're now, what, four or five generations into promoting tourism. You've got kids that grew up. That's all they've ever done is work in a hotel or a restaurant and uh, a guide guiding. So... Uh, you know, the whole thing is involving into something that's really uh, 
a respectable business down here and world class. I agree with you entirely. Yeah. And the, oh, back in the old days, people just came in, you know, from Yucatan to work. And now we have generations of people who've been in the hospitality industry and we're, you know, it's, it's developed quite nicely. Yes. And uh, I think the government uh, now has gotten around to seeing the pluses of uh, foreign investment. You now can own a hundred percent of a Mexican corporation as a foreigner that changed 10, 12 years ago. So we have a lot, you know, we have almost a million Americans uh, alone uh, living in Mexico full time. So it's it's really become a uh, universal uh, area. I simply love it. There's so much diversity. Um, you know, you've traveled around, you know, the Yucatan and the Gulf and that. Is Ishklak your favorite place in Mexico or do you have another place where your heart is or where you would, you all, it was just kind of one of those favorite spots? You know, there's some beaches up by Akamal that I love, but I'm just, I'm sitting here in my office. Um, I, you know, I lived in a Palapa off and on for probably 25 years. Uh, Alana and I built this house uh, seven, eight years ago. We moved into it, spent two years building it. I'm sitting here looking out at uh, waves breaking on the second biggest uh, barrier reef uh, in the world. It's a little rainy today, but uh, you know, I'm six miles from uh, flats fishing. I can walk out the front door and go snorkeling or diving. This is Pretty much my favorite place to be. It doesn't get much better than that, does it? No. No, it's, <laughs> it's uh, pretty amazing where we live. So one of the questions that I ask everybody who I talk to is, what are some of your secret spots or hidden gems when you do take a little bit of time, whether it's a, a place to go grab a taco or to go snorkel or a little trip out. Do you have any little secret places? And they can even be in Chetamal. I know you guys go to Chetamal a lot. But do you have any little places you'd like to share with people that, that they could, might be able to want to come down and experience firsthand? Well, we like Rancho Encantado and Bacalar. We stop there and have lunch a lot. There's a place called uh, Taco Loco. Then Chetamal, a little hole-in-the-wall restaurant that you can get uh, hand-picked blue crab meat tacos for like a buck a piece or something. And uh, ceviches that are fresh, fresh. I mean, there are some places like that, but you would have to be here a long time before you would ever uh, find them, you know. And um, we like that kind of stuff. Uh, we go down to San Pedro. It's only uh, 35 miles south of us. Uh, uh, spend the day down there. A lot better hardware store. In, uh, San that's 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 San Pedro Belize, San right? San Pedro Belize. We know do area. day trips down there for with our clients. Uh, mostly, we go down there to buy um, American-made uh, hardware, hose clamps, fitting, hoses, stuff like that. Oh wow! I didn't know you could find that stuff on Ambergris Key. Interesting. Oh, Ambergris is really building up. Big time. Yeah, there's another there's another destination that's changed a lot over the years. Um, so let me ask you, Dave. There's an island, and I went there and I saw a whole lot of birds. It was out on, with one of your guides. We went on a tour. Was that called Bird Island? Is that still in existence? I mean, do people still go there? Yes, it's a big uh, rookery. It's in Chetamal Bay. It's maybe a forty minute uh, boat trip from the uh, hotel out to Bird Island. But we found another one a little bit closer, a little remoter. Uh, it's off the river that divides uh, Mexico and Belize. But it's a real small, uh, it couldn't be uh, 50 feet across each way. But it's just full of uh, birds. It's amazing. So, yeah, we do have a lot of birds down in this area. Is there a lot of birders coming down there, or is it kind of one of those undiscovered birding places? I would say we had more birders about a, 10 years ago than we do now. I, I don't know what happened um, or why they're not coming. You know, I think the, a lot of bad press has, has put some people off, but i got to tell you, there's no problem anywhere in this state that I know of. Just rumors that uh, have ruined a lot of people's vacations for, for not coming down here. 
No, I agree. And, you know, we get we get asked questions about safety and uh, and trying to dispel some of the myths that the U.S. media has portrayed. But, you know, it's like going anywhere. If you're looking for trouble. Now, in Ishkalak, there's not a whole lot to look for. I know there's not a lot. Of, there's no trouble there. But, you know, if you wanted to find trouble in, say, Cancun or Playa, if you're looking for it, you can probably find it the same way you can find it in Houston or New Orleans or, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, we have a total of 200 people in the whole town. So uh, I've, <laughs> I've been here for three generations of those guys. So I know everybody. But uh, no, nah, it's uh, really laid back a, a little fishing village. No, I think I think a lot. It's um, it has the charms and the some of the spirit that that people are still looking for is, is some of the more uh, bigger towns get built up up north, like Playa del Carmen. There's still people who are looking for those those places that have the old school charm that are laid back and who just want to just kick back and relax, have a beer, go fishing, go diving, or just do nothing. Exactly. And that's who we're looking for. Yeah. And as they said, and sometimes, you know, the internet, as we've dropped out here a couple times, is that offline is the new luxury item. And so you guys sometimes have lots of that luxury item when you can't get online. Well, I got to tell you, it's, uh, we have a Spaniard here now. Uh, as you know, we started uh, the internet system down here, uh, Alana and I, about, oh, 16 years ago, I guess. We got all the neighbors together and pooled up enough money to get internet down here. And it, it was very sporadic. But compared to driving 70 miles to use the phone it was really convenient <laughs> i can imagine i can imagine i used to have to drive from akamal to tulum i can't imagine doing 70 miles yeah yeah it was amazing but uh yeah now i mean we still don't have cell phone service and i swear to god this is true we only got am radio like six, seven years ago out of uh, Chet them all trying to finally adjust their antenna so the workers could listen to the news. Maybe you need to start a radio station, Radio Ishkalak. <laughs> Next project, Dave. Yeah. I'll get some free time and we'll put together a radio station. Yeah, yeah, come on down. <laughs> hey, I just might, you just never know. Well, Dave, I appreciate the time that you've taken because, you know what, and, and I've had this, I've said this often to people who I haven't spoken to in a while, is um, the time goes fast and our visits are too, are too far in between. And I hope to see you guys soon, but I love talking to you and catching up. And, you know, I learn something every time I talk to you. I learn a little something more about you and Ilana and your story in Ishkalak and Costa de Cocos. Now, where can people find you and Ilana? What's the best way to get in touch with you guys? You can get in touch with us through uh, localgringo.com. Oh, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Now, also, you can go to Dave's website. You can Google him, Costa de Cocos. There will be um, – there. Ilana handles fa – she's on their Facebook page. And if everybody turns into our show notes that we have on Local Gringo, I'll have links to Costa de Cocos and some of these great places Dave's talked about and links over to their social media accounts so you can keep up. Especially if you're a fisherman, you can watch those pictures of those Graham Slams because I know they put some happy, happy fisherman faces up there as they're holding their catch. So that's always wonderful to see. And on the Fly Fishing K, we have the last – 30 pages of the book uh, Fly Fishing Mexico, which was the number one fly fishing book on Amazon for nearly a year. So if you just go to Amazon.com and get the uh, book Fly Fishing Mexico, it's got all kind of details on this area, a lot of photos of our flats, the hotel, and uh, Give, it, give you a good idea of what the fishing's like down here in Mexico. Oh, excellent, Dave. And you know what? I'm going to add that we just have we now have a Loco Gringo library on our website, and we promote books that we think are useful to people wanting to learn more about the area. So I'll add that book to our rating list. Yeah, it's on our website if you want to grab the info off that. 
Perfect. I'll do that. Well, Dave, thank you so much for your time. And I will give you a shout um, if I get to come down your way. And, you know, I did try my hand at fishing that one time. It didn't work really well. But maybe I could go out with somebody, with y'all. We watch Il- You and I will watch Ilana fish. And we'll sit back and have a tarvin pale ale. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for, thank for uh, you. calling. And it was great to talk to you. Great talking to you. My love to you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed listening to Dave's stories from Ixcalac, Mexico. I invite you to visit his website at costadecocos.com. And our show notes have a link right over to that page as well if you want to check out our website. I also invite you to stop by Dave sometime. If you're looking for a true adventure, Costa de Cocos is the place for it, whether you want to go fly fishing, diving, or you just want to hang on the beach and drink a beer. Well, until next week, my best to you. Hasta la vista. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe. For links, show notes, and more information, head on over to LocoGringo.com or give us a call toll-free at 800-478-0081. Porque se tragó la luna, estaba enferma la rana, su madre soba que soba de dos de pluma la panza, pensó ranita que luna era una toronja blanca. Y aunque la luna es de leche, la leche estaba cortada. Croa, croa, dedos de pluma. Croa, croa, dedos de agua. Croa, croa.